Right. Cool. Okay, so first, uh, Conrad, can you kind of give a brief introduction of yourself again? It's been, I think, two years almost since I last interviewed you. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I have been working pretty much full time for the last three years in the UBI space on a couple of different projects, um, essentially in a research and uh, activism sort of way. Um, for the entire time, I've been working on a project called Bootstraps, which is a uh, docu-series that my wife and I are creating, uh, which essentially the aim is to show UBI in practice. So we have 21 different Americans across 10 states receiving a basic it income for two years, and we're we're filming with them throughout the course of it, and we'll release a docu-series, um, looks like, in 2020. Uh, and on the side, I've also been working on um, this thing I call the UBI calculator. And the UBI calculator, so both of these projects are basically meant to answer the two main hang-ups, the two questions you get to when you're having a discussion about UBI. Uh, and Bootstraps is dealing with the you know, what are people going to do with the money? Are they going to be lazy question? And the UBI calculator is dealing with that. Well, how are you going to pay for it? Is it just going to be taxing the middle class? That, that kind of stuff. So the, what, the, what the calculator does is it um, allows any American citizen to go in and type in their household size and income and find out how different versions of basic income plans from Scott Santons to... Uh, Andrew Yang to uh, some sample plans and other activists, how it would affect them uh, in the net, how it would affect their finances, and also how it would affect the American economy as a whole. On this specific app, how, what, what led you to make this app? Was it a conversation where someone asked you how you funded? What, what kind of sparked this idea? Uh, it was just became pretty quickly obvious to me after having the discussion, you know, hundreds of times, um, where there was always a hang up. And it seemed to me that it would be best to be able to avoid that, you know, that it basically, you know, it takes a while to go through the math of basic income and to convince someone or to, to, to even really be sure you're um, more than in just theory. Um, and I wanted people to be able to get through that conversation, myself included, without it taking so long. I wanted just a quick and easy tool so people could see what the impact would look like uh, for myself and for my time. What sort of reactions have you had so far? Uh, they've been pretty positive. I haven't done a huge push on it quite yet. I'm waiting for um, a couple more things to come together before I do a big, I, I try a big uh, hashtag campaign. But um, yeah, people seem to appreciate the simplicity of it as well as the de detail of it. Um, yeah, so far it's been very positive. Can you go into a little bit about the process of putting this project together? Yeah, um, I mean, it wasn't easy. I knew from the beginning, like there, I had seen some other UBI calculators out there. There's one or two that you could find just Googling them. And it always basically felt like this is a tool that someone did in their spare time um, that's super wonky and hard to really read and parse through and limited in its capacity and the sort of thing that only other people like me might find and try to work their way through. Whereas what I felt was needed was something that was viralizable, like ultimately simple to use and easy to share, and someone can glean good information out of it in less than a minute. Um, and I also wanted it to be, you know, I think credibility comes from not only the depth of the analysis 
uh, when you're talking about web, web tools. I think it also comes from the ease of use and just the, the ease of functionality, like how, how, how slick does it look, basically. So I knew I wanted to do something that was more than just, you know, me banging away on my spreadsheet. Um, and, that's, and that's how I developed the math behind the calculator was all in, you know, just Google spreadsheets and spending lots of time plugging away at it. Um, but, yeah, I knew I'd have to raise a significant amount of money to do something that I believed could have a potential of being shared a lot and making, having a real impact on the narrative. So I went and raised money uh, over over time, um, and I ended up raising like seventy thousand dollars to to make the version of it that I thought it needed to be. Do you plan to add any additional features? Yeah, I do. Uh, so version one, I wanted to be super functional and be able to, to encompass certain plans that are already out there, specifically Andrew Yang's, because he's so pos so popular right now. Um, but there are, there's, so there are maybe 10 funding mechanisms on there for how to fund a UBI, including, you know, the VAT tax that he likes to use, uh, adjusting, so, uh, in, adjusting income brackets, either with a flat tax or with progressive taxation, um, uh, reducing military spending, doing a carbon tax. There's, there's about 10 right now, but there are, at least eight more that I want to add that require extra, you know, economic analysis. And then on the functionality side, right now, basically, you can dig into the effects of different plans that are currently proposed, which is about nine different plans. Um, but I want it to eventually be sort of a platform for for all sorts of plans to be uh, assessed and. Uh, and maybe upvoted, and I want there. I want to open up the functionality to what I call a policymaker mode, which will allow people to go in and play with the actual economics themselves, and see, you know, how things could be funded, how they might want to do it themselves. Like maybe they're against, you know, taking money from the military and flat taxes, but they 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 really want to have a carbon tax and see how much can be made from that, and um or a land value tax or certain people in the libertarian movement that are really interested in land value. Uh, and I want them to be able to put forward the proposal that goes by their values and be able to see the economics that underpin it all without having, you know, to take some pundits word for it and put forward their plans. And so I see the, um, the calculator eventually as being a repository for, all the different versions of UBI people can come up with um, and a place to, to let the best ideas flow to the top. I'm curious if um, you've talked about doing some dynamic effects, like perhaps uh, the Roosevelt Institute taking their um, assumptions that they use to look at the effects of UBI on the economy. Is that something that uh, you've, you've talked about adding? Uh, I, it was definitely a, a, something I spent a while thinking about. And something I definitely want to make clear is, is valid. This idea that uh, you know, we can have windfalls from um, the, the reduction in costs of, of poverty, crime, and health emergencies. We can have windfall from the uh, economic stimulus of just putting money in the hands of consumers, uh, which creates jobs and creates extra revenue. And the, the issue is he, um, the Roosevelt experiment is one liable to be viewed as very rosy and, you know, left wing, I would say, um, even though I, it's, it's a credible ex um, a credible study to me and it's also by nature very speculative it's based on an analysis of a new model we've never had and um, it's really hard to justify it as a totally conservative analysis if we don't really have a benchmark to, to measure it against uh, and I my goal with this calculator was above all to be entirely conservative and credible basically show 
what would be the worst case scenarios under each of these plans and if we and if if they're justifiable as worth it even under their worst case scenarios then they're very justifiable as worth it in general and, and uh, my approach regarding the extra speculative windfalls um, was to, to you know put a lot of information on there and a little tooltip so you can click on and see like this is why this amount of deficit spending is okay um, and because it it would be paid back by these other windfalls, potentially, theoretically, and then also give space in each plan for the proposer of that plan to justify their amount of deficit spending and expected windfalls and, you know, reference the Roosevelt study or other studies. Um, but to put it directly into the calculations seemed to me something that might hurt the overall perceived credibility of the calculator. In terms of the the people who made it and the donations that came in um who were some of the people behind the scenes that were helping you um and how how was all of that uh, budget spent um most of it went to the developers so i worked with a really great company out of uh, eugene oregon called uh, 20 ideas and i met them through some UBI friends that were that had worked on other cool projects. Uh, Giselle Huff, actually, who runs a uh, a page now called the uh, Fund for Humanity, um, she helped with connecting and helped me with some fundraising. And basically, I cobbled together most of the funding came from, um, I'd say, four larger donors. And then I had a couple thousand dollars come in from uh, a GoFundMe, which I used to help pay. We had a grad student in Casey doing the a lot of the economics, and it, which were overseen uh, by Stephen Pressman, who's a PhD economist, um, multi-published author. So uh, a certain amount went towards the economics. A certain amount I still have for contingency and for the ongoing costs of running the site and the, the vast majority of it went to paying the developer team who um they were nice enough to give big discounts to me because they believe in the project but yeah it was not a small task making something that runs smoothly and and sort of as slickly as it does if i may say that how many hours do you think you put into it me personally i uh, it's hard to quantify that. I've been working on it for over a year in concept. You know, I had originally I had uh, an intern last summer who I got through a program to be paid for by their school who worked on it for 10 weeks. And um, in my, my hours alone, just putting together the spreadsheet that was the guts of the calculations and leading the project, I don't know, definitely in the hundreds. And Ultimately, what effect are you hoping? I, I mean, if this is coming out right before the 2020 election, was that intentional? Oh, absolutely. I, all the work we're doing uh, with the film, too, is, is, um, is geared towards a timeline of having an impact on the national discussion in time for the 2020 election. Uh, so, yeah, right now is a very powerful moment uh, in the UBI movement the opinion throughout that it needed that UBI needs to be more of a grassroots movement if it's going to be a thing that's that gets something legislated if it's going to do more than it did in the 70s where it got pinged around in the house and senate and abandoned um, the people need to know about it and they need to be excited about it um, or are given the chance to and that can't happen if it's if it's delivered to them through you know pundits who don't really have it's not really in their agenda you know so my goal was to bring credible, honest information to people in a way that um, is quick and easily accessible and easily shared and can maybe go viral. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I wanted to have a big effect on how people perceive UBI in the very near future for the election. Have you uh, reached out or spoken with the Yang campaign? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, 
uh, in, in trying to make sure I accurately uh, quantify their plan and, and describe it, um, I was definitely looking for participation from them to, you know, be clear on the details. Some of the details, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a young campaign and no campaign has their exact policy completely measured out. So in some cases it was asking them to define things that they, you know, they can't be totally certain on yet. Um, so it, it required uh, definitely working with them and it's still ongoing to make sure that w what I'm representing for them, like I did with everyone who proposed a plan, but they're the most visible. Uh, it was important to sh that what I represented for them was fair and no special favors, but definitely what they would want their plan to be represented as within the context of the calculator. Have you had any negative reactions? Uh, I've had different I. I haven't really had negative reactions. I've had different um, people wanting different functionalities on there, and um, I'm very open to feedback. Uh, a lot of them are things that I definitely spent a long time thinking about already and made a choice for one reason or another. You know, they're the trade-offs of usability and credibility versus certain functionalities that, you know, might only really... Um, be super interesting to someone who's on the wonkier side and wants to dig in. Um, and then it's, it's impossible to have like a perfect calculator. It's impossible to account for, you know, like a uh, social security income. I have it basically if you're over 65, then you can put in if you have social security. But in reality, social security starts, it's potentially at 62 or potentially at 70 and it's at different levels and the whole tax code and the benefits code in America is very, um, Byzantine. So in order to simplify it and still have it justifiably conservative, there were a lot of assumptions made that would, you know, take take the worst case scenario and, and round down to that and say, you know, if you're if you're getting a different level of, of welfare or social security, we're at least going to account for the worst it could be for you. Um, if if the calculator can't directly handle your specific situation. Have there been any big surprises while you've completed this? Um, I mean, for, for me, it's, it's personally very rewarding to finally feel like I know what I'm talking about more with the math, not just from going through and doing the calculations a million times and kind of knowing like, oh, yeah, if we remove the Social Security tax cap, that's, you know, $240 billion. Or like, just knowing that kind of stuff um, is just really analyzing how the, the plans would work out beyond the theory and, you know, intuition of it, having some things validated, having some things change, and, and being able to look specifically at each plan for its weaknesses and its strengths. Um, like everyone who's posted a plan on there, you know, there are, there are ways that could be tweaked and improved that I can see, including Yang's. You know, I, there's, there, are certain, there are certain opportunities and, and weaknesses that stand out, and everybody's, if you um, spend a good, uh, good amount of time looking at it. So I think beyond just having this be an opportunity for the everyday American to see how different plans would affect them, it's a great opportunity for people who are Dig in and analyze, you know, the, the the finer parameters and details of their plans, and also open it up to, um, say, other politicians. I mean, part of part of what I think is interesting about this is, especially as I add in other funding mechanisms like wealth taxes and land value taxes and things like that, there are more and more ways for someone who is not already specifically promoting UBI to play around with it and decide if there's a way in for them. Like, you know, Liz Warren is really fond of a wealth tax, uh, and there's nothing saying a wealth tax can't go towards funding a UBI. Uh, and, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez promotes, you know, a high, um, a, a high ta tax rate on top earners over five and $10 million. Uh, that's an option I have in the calculator, and there's nothing, nothing saying that that can't fund part of a UBI and now the argument is 
So what's the best way to use the revenue we have from these different, these different strategies? And it also is the information about how, how much can we actually raise and how much would it actually be? Like there's one plan on there that I just did is if we did a $60 carbon tax or something along those lines, you know, all by itself and we were just starting a small UBI off it, how much would everyone get? And it's about $1,000 a year. Um, and just so, so there's infinite room for play and for people with different political values to come in and find out what a UBI could mean under their system and see with something like a carbon tax, okay, this is a normally a regressive policy. Like a carbon tax is generally on the backs of the people if you're just taking the revenue and giving it to the government. But if you do it as a dividend, you can actually see with the calculator how it's not regressive, how it's actually giving more money to the people in the bottom 80% or so than, than they would be paying in extra at the gas pump. I'm curious actually then you mentioned trade-offs with uh, all of these plans, but I'm most interested in your opinion on Yang's UBI plan. What are some of the strengths and weaknesses that you see specifically compared to the other uh, proposals uh, with Yang's yeah. plan? Uh, I think one of Yang's strengths, first of all, it's a full $12,000 UBI. That's great. Um, uh, another strength is that he, I think if the fewer funding mechanisms you have, the more saleable it is. So something like Scott Santon's or Liana Gale's plan, I see, like I, I worked with Liana on hers and Scott had his own ideas of how he should do his that were very defined. And, and, you know, there are like 13 different funding mechanisms going in and each, each one of these is something you need to like get through Congress, right? Whereas something like just the, the one I called carbon tax and dividend now is just a carbon tax. So that's the idea of passing that is a lot more feasible. And Yang's is somewhere in between where he's got a certain set of, of taxes. He doesn't deal with the income tax code. Uh, so there's, there's maybe less potential political pitfalls there. And maybe he has a better chance of passing it, right? Um, uh, a few things that... Another thing is, so Yang's plan fits within my calculators, what I call, and will be more uh, important when it comes to policymaker mode, is the do no harmometer. <laughs> this uh, so, sort of a feature I have built in to not let anyone propose any plan that's tr too draconian. And one of those things is the, the certain welfares that can be cut are limited to food stamps, TANF, which is you know, temporary assistance for needy families, uh, typically thought of as welfare and uh, S disability SSI. Um, and those are the only things he's cutting. He's not cutting housing. He's not cutting um, SSDI. He's not cutting other things. So he, his plan does fit within uh, what I have modeled as a plan that's not um, something like, you know, the libertarian, a libertarian model that's more draconian that's like give everyone 10,000 thousand bucks and cut everything including Medicare that's not even on the table for the calculator um, and so you know every plan on here is is probably going to be beneficial to most people that said there are a couple of ways that there's room for improvement and you know I've reached out to them and they can change their parameters anytime they want um, one is uh, they have quite a bit of deficit spending uh, I think it's a it's more than they've justified on their website. Uh, so they've justified about a trillion dollars with the Roosevelt study, and with in um, with economic so with economic stimulus from the Roosevelt study, as well as uh, loss in extra costs due to healthcare emergencies and crime, they have justified it up to about a trillion. And their deficit spending right now is about one and a half trillion. And part of that is because of uh, they've done to reduce the regressiveness of the VAT tax. So when Andrew Yang comes out and says uh, a VAT tax raises $800 billion, but he, so he's going to do a 10% VAT tax, but he also says they're going to exempt certain staple items like grocery, food, and clothing, and, and public transportation. 
that's good and that those are things that are more uh, purchased by the lower classes but also that definitely reduces the revenue that the that tax can bring in to more like 690 billion so he loses 100 billion there and you know their analysis has necessarily been a lot more uh, rough napkin sketch because no one really has done what I've done with the calculator before so they have a lot of deficit spending and I, I would suggest to them a few different ways to bring that down to the level that they've justified so that this the expense on the his plan can look more like an investment than a loss and um, I think uh, they would be best suited giving a small UBI to kids. Uh, right now, it's only adults 18 and over. And I think that specifically runs into a problem when you think of single parents, especially single parents on welfare. There are, there are plenty of them that could be, uh, could, be, could be worse off in that sort of a situation. And it could be solved fairly easily with a UBI for kids that's about a quarter of the size of a UBI for adults, so $3,000 a year would make an enormous difference in that. Um, the other thing I would suggest to them, there's one more, is uh, regarding social SSI disability, uh, which is supplemental security income, which is disability that is for people that are generally on the poorer end and haven't been able to work and pay into what's called SSDI, um, which is up to $771 a month, I think is the maximum you can get. and his plan is basically that that is replaceable by UBI. Um, and in fairness to them, one of their arguments, which is valid for it, is that they also push for uh, a Medicare for all system that would cover a lot of the expenses of disability. But I think in talking to a lot of people with disability and, and learning, you know, that it's not just about it's not just about medical expenses. It's also about just the cost of living in a society that's not built for you, I would suggest cutting it, cutting SSI to some smaller number and then changing the way it functions, making it unconditional on work and unconditional on income so that once you're getting SSI for whatever qualification you need to prove that you have a disability, then you get it unconditionally, sort of like a UBI plus. And, that, and if you do that, you save a lot of money on the SSI system, but you're still acknowledging these extra costs of living with disability. And you also are no longer disincentivizing people with disability from working because they're not going to all of a sudden lose their benefits if someone spots them working or s seeming too healthy, you know? Um, so those are the three main things with Yang's plan. I think they're pretty easy tweaks. And, you know, I'm reaching out and giving them the opportunity to change that or or do it some other way. Um, but yeah. What would you say are the biggest misconceptions that are cleared up or at least clarified by the calculator? Um, I think the biggest misconception and the main reason I did it is that this is paid for on the backs of the public, um, like the middle class. I think the one thing people didn't get that I wanted to be a massively understand thing is just how rich the rich are. You know, you can fund something like this without, without it being on the middle class because of how much wealth is and income is going towards the upper classes. So I wanted to show that, you know, you can have, you can easily have plans, even ones that are not huge amounts of deficit spending, that are benefiting 70, 80 percent plus of the public, just in terms of net financial outcome, and then arguably benefiting a lot of people above that, that break-even line, because their businesses have way more customers, they live in a better society, you know. Um, and I wanted to show that, just attack the the scarcity model, uh, the scarcity mindset that there obviously can't be enough money for this because I think that's the main thing that keeps us from believing that something like a UBI is possible. It's just not really understanding how much money is tied up uh, in, the, in the top 10% and 1%. And I think this really does show that. If you look in the detailed plans and you click about two-thirds of the way down, you can click uh, 
see the detailed analysis, you can see these charts of basically the income graphs in America and just see how they shift. And you can see, you know, the black line is the, is, is the current situation and the green line is the proposed plan. And you can see all other to the left, you can see the poverty line, you can see under a plan, oh wow, this lifts every single person above the poverty line as a starting place. And you can see where it crosses over and people start um, becoming net contributors to the plan, so they're paying a little more than they're getting. And you, and you go all the way over to the right to the top 1% and it still shoots up off the graph. You know, it's still, there's people that can be fabulously wealthy in a society where everyone is successful enough to survive as a guarantee. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that that's what really sticks is that we preeminently have the money to do this. It's just a matter of political will. And that um, the idea behind trying to make this viralizable is, you know, we, we live in a society that some argue is more of an oligarchy at this point. I think there was a Princeton study a few years ago that we can have 70, 60 or 70 percent of people that technically want something and we don't get it. Um, and I think that's one of the big issues we face is the power of money, uh, the power of money in our politics. But I still believe that we're enough of a democracy, or I hope that if you can have something supported and supported, you know, energetically by 80, 85 percent of the public, even simply because it, it means extra dollars per year in their bank account, then it has a chance of passing. Do you see any plan on here as um, more well-developed and perhaps more politically feasible than others? Um, I mean, there's, there's trade-offs in every one of them, right? You trade off deficit spending for the number of citizens that gain money, and, and both of those are politically, uh, are politically tricky issues. Um, you trade off you know, number of different funding mechanisms you would have to pass for the amount of revenue and the size of the UBI you can have. Um, you trade off certain, certain, certain things that are, are um, classically understood as regressive and people are biased against, like a flat tax. Um, there's the, the overcoming, even with this tool, the overcoming of the idea that a flat tax is a bad thing, whereas you can, if you really look at it, there's even a plan with a 50% flat tax in here that shows it's widely progressive if it's funding a basic income. And that's still going to be a narrative to overcome because it's something we've, you know, grown up with for our entire lives. Um, I tend to think it's beneficial to have all these plans on here to show the, the more, um, the more idealistic versions, like if we did this, 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 and this, and these 20 different funding mechanisms and put this percentage of it towards a UBI, we'd have a robust raft of funding mechanisms that would last. Like, a, for example, a carbon tax is meant to self-obsolete. So if you just fund with a carbon tax, eventually that funding source goes away as we stop using fossil fuels, right? Um, so I see some of those as more like uh, long-term goals to build up a UBI to have that sort of robust funding mechanism and the benefit of having something in there which is like just a carbon tax or just you know removing social security tax cap and doing um doing the things that are like political no-brainers and loopholes for the rich and like how much could we get out of that also has a value uh because i see that very feasibly being a path to having ubi in this country is starting with a smaller ubi and and proving the concept and and creating the demand to, you know, fund it further. Um, so I think uh, some are more ideal for me in terms of where we'd want to get to, and some are more ideal for me in terms of what I'd want to try to sell in this political climate and try to get past quickly. And how could folks out there who are interested in helping promote this, what should they go and how, sh how should they go and promote this uh, calculator? I mean, the idea I had was that it should be pretty self-explanatory is that 
if you're trying to talk to someone, uh, so if you're an advocate or if you're just curious, if you're trying to talk to someone about the math of UBI, this gets you out of that whole conversation. You can just say to people, just go to ubicalculator.com and see how you see how you shake out and see which plans you like, uh, and literally take that question down to ten seconds. You know, if you're if you're a, a regular average person or an advocate or Andrew Yang in the middle of a debate. I want people to be able to say, you know, just check, just check the calculator and see how you do. And that's, and that's just a quick message people can say um, to not just to share it, but to share the information and, and save themselves a lot of time. Any plans to open this up for activists in other countries to model? Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely been interest. I know that there's someone in Canada who would really like to do a similar model. Um, I have to, I, I want that to be a thing people can do, but I also want to make sure that the branding is, remains credible. Uh, uh and I don't imagine I'm going to want to put in hundreds more hours into learning some other country's tax code. So I, I might want to have some sort of arrangement where whoever, um, you know, permission to work with the developer and use kind of what we did, but keep the branding somewhat different so that, you know, the American UBI calculator is not held liable for other, UB, other national UBI calculators results. Um, and also to consult with them and say, this was my basic approach. There are a lot of reasons I chose to do like an ultra mathematically conservative method and I would really suggest it um, but also yeah I, I, I would love to find a way for this to be a tool for this to grow and, and exist in other countries Any final thoughts that we haven't covered? Um, I guess one other thing about that last bit is that I would be really curious about like a lot of the reason I made this calculator is because I was really curious myself to know that I wasn't just making stuff up you know i wasn't just leaning on speculation that could be widely off the mark so i wanted to validate my own stuff and one of the um things i'd be curious to see regarding calculators in other nations is what what is the reality for countries with different financial situations you know so with america we're per capita I, I don't actually know if this is 100% true, but we're definitely one of the, the richest countries in the history of the world. So it's a lot more understandable that there are many ways we could fund this. Uh, I think it would probably be similar for Canada and other first, first world countries. But what happens when you have a country like, you know, a developing country that, that wants to do it? Um, do they have the money to fund a complete and livable universal basic income or would they have to start at some level of universal income and how much could they could they with their national resources how much could they provide their citizens uh, and really start the discussion on how much could they do for themselves but also I would like to open up the conversation on if a country has a basic income structure in place regardless of how much they're able to themselves give to their citizens does it become a much better way to provide foreign aid? You know, if you're if you're giving money to another country, but it's always in the form of John Deere tractors through corporations, or it's in the, or it's given through a, a corrupt government, or through a Red Cross organization, or something like that, and a lot of the money gets lost to um, <clears throat> salaries, maybe incompetence. You know, maybe it could be just done better by giving cash to the people. How much more effective does foreign aid become in general when, when countries that can't fully fund their own UBI have a UBI system? Uh, so that's one of the things I'd like to see is just, you know, if you're in Kenya or if you're in uh, El Salvador or something, like how much, how big of a UBI can they do? If you're in Puerto Rico, you know, I think about like one of these, one of these uh, giving pledge billionaires like Warren Buffett could could personally fund 
uh, a, a livable UBI in Puerto Rico for something like five, 10 years. But if you worked with the government and they put together their own system, how much longer could it be extended if they were benefiting from, you know, the economic stimulus and windfalls and things like that? So I think there, there is a lot that could be gained on an international scale, which I think is especially important because UBI, the universality of UBI, eventually we wanted to extend beyond national borders. It's not universal American basic income. UBI is about human beings and human rights. So we want to see how to take this international and, and start bringing up standards of living all over the world. Well, I mean, I totally agree with that. And actually, um, our team in Taiwan is really interested in doing something similar to this because I think this is um, this is one of the best ways that I've seen anywhere explaining the nuts and bolts of UBI plans. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. Um, so really, congratulations on well, thank really, you. What, yeah, truly one of the best um explanations for how it would actually function because in i guess four or five years being with ubi we've had those conversations i'm sure you have too where people just don't believe that they'll come out ahead they're going to pay more taxes and then they're going to be uh worse off so i'm hoping we can throw this at them and and at least make them think 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 twice and maybe maybe be persuaded um, if they can actually see it for themselves, how it'll affect their own family. Mm -hmm. Good, great. That's exactly what I was hoping it would uh, it would do. You know, so if it can help you guys in the movement be a lot more effective and in, in communicating the the reality of UBI, then that is a goal accomplished. All right, Conrad. Um, any final thoughts? Uh, no, any, if anyone's listening, just, yeah, I would say just go to the calculator and check it out yourself because it's meant to be sort of self-explanatory. So, um, and any yeah. international listeners, I hope that you can be inspired by this because I think you're right. This is really something that, um, other country, I'd be really intrigued how other countries, especially developing countries, how their plans would, would work out as well. Mm-hmm. All right, Conrad. Well, thanks again. Um, keep in touch. I also want to hear about um, an update on your documentary sometime when you when you have some uh, news on that. Um, I mean, I, I do have a little. If if you uh, sure, want go to ahead. hear a little sure. news sure. about What's, about bootstraps. yeah, please, please. I mean, we're, we we've been plugging along for the last few years. We have the the, the UBI trial is fully funded for the twenty one Americans. Um, Several of them are almost at the end of their two-year trials. We staggered them in, so everyone's done more than a year. And so we have a conception of a, a two-season docu-series, and the first season covers year one, and the second season covers year two. So we've got year one in the can. We're starting to edit. We have, we've raised enough money at this point to be able to hit the edit full on, and we're putting together a pilot, and we're getting ready to start you know, approaching distributors and things like that. Um, so I would say uh, we're going to start making more and more noise about it, and so you might start hearing more about it and look out for it um, in 2020. Do you have a general time frame? Um, I mean, the original goal was to be as early in the um, as early in the in the primaries as possible with season one, and then. So at some point before the um, at some point before the general was season two, so it's kind of like a double whammy on the election cycle. Um, but that said, you know that's our initial conception, and a lot of it to when we're ready to release. What does the political landscape look like? What's going to be the most sure. impactful? What kind of a deal do we have with a distributor? Um, so we're going to constantly be reassessing. So I hesitate to say exactly when. Yeah, is like one around the primaries and one around the general. Oh wow! So in terms of you mean the season, you'll release to both seasons in twenty twenty, is the hope. That's that's the hope. I mean, 
but maybe something shows itself to us that a different timeline would be better between now and then. So we're staying open to what's going to be the most impactful um, and what's going to allow us to bring out the best, the best is, product, you know. The is, is there um, any kind of, I don't want to say spoilers, but is there anything you can kind of let us know about uh, what, you, uh, what you encountered during the documentary? Um, I mean, I don't want to say anything too spoilery, and I yeah. also want to maintain our our credibility. Is like we're we're approaching this is very scientifically. Good, good, good. Not trying to sell UBI, but just demonstrate it. What I will say is that the um the effects of living with the UBI have been even probably even quicker and more dramatic than we expected. Um, so a lot happens in two years. And one of the things it reminds me of, you know, when we're basically casting the people in the show and, and deciding how we're going to cover this, is like a fear that would pop into my head is, you know, what if the people have just super boring lives, you know, and they don't do anything, there's not really anything to share. You know, they have two years where nothing really happens. And it's like, well, that's why originally we were thinking a feature film where, like, we'll take the three or four best stories. And we were quickly reminded that, that man, life is hard and shit happens. And if you might forget about it in the blur, but you're like always dealing with some sort of thing that's coming up. And and so nobody's life is boring. And so there were, were no stories we could cut and they're all very important and telling in one way or another. Um, and and the, the effect of having some sort of on conditional cash coming in is always relevant. And is each episode covering a specific recipient? Uh, I mean, we're still going to figure out what that is. We, we kind of ping back and forth, but I think the idea is most likely to check in with three or four recipients per episode and kind of keep the whole chronology moving together. Mm. Because especially if we release season one is year one, um, then, you know, we're doing two, two, two seasons of six, six episodes at an hour apiece is, is sort of the idea. Um, there would be like half the participants we couldn't show that year, right? Um, that season. Uh, yeah, the idea is sort of, sort of build the stories together as they go so that everyone's sort of three months, six months, nine months in at the same time. And you, as the viewer, you, I guess you would basically watch these people catching up to you in time. You know, they start in 2017. You recognize the stuff going on in the world then. And, you know, over the course of the season, you move ahead a few weeks maybe, and the bootstrappers move ahead a year. And then the next season, by the end of the season, they're almost caught up to you, you know. So it's sort of a more chronological feeling I think we'll probably end up doing. And in terms of distribution, um, what's what's that looking like now? Or do you have some offers or general kind of directions you're going in that? I mean, we have a bunch of uh, people we're talking to, and we're essentially right now putting together a pilot to to really do to really go out and pitch it and see um, see where it makes the most sense to put it, see who's the most interested. Um, see where it's going to have the most impact. Um, so yeah, we're still nothing's as yet defined on that, but there, you know, we're definitely talking to to plenty of people and working that out. And so the recipients, they're gonna their um, basic income is going to end this year, or it already ended last year. Um, no, uh, everyone's still receiving their basic income. Okay. So. Some are going to end this month and next month, the first three stories. Um, about half the stories are going to end in April of next year, and the last two end in June of next year. Um, one thing we have done is we've raised a bit more money um, because we didn't want to just like be releasing our series and have just dropped everyone off their basic income because we got what we needed, whatever. It feels kind of exploitive. So we, we've actually raised a bit of extra money to extend their trials five months so far. 
I'm hoping we can get that up to maybe a year so that while this is in the public eye, um, they'll still have some money coming in and basically extend their trial uh, to be covered not by us, but covered by, you know, the news or whoever, whoever wants and to give them sort of, sort of a, a softer landing, you know, and more time to more time to prepare. And how are they are how are they handling that uh, that aspect of it coming to an end? Um, I mean, it, so every UBI trial has grains of salt, right? The only way to really understand UBI is to do a fully full national permanent impl implementation and just see how it goes, because until you have total saturation, you don't really know the macroeconomic effects of UBI until everyone is getting it instead of like picking out one person here and there and kind of hiding it from the people they know so they don't get too much attention. And then there's also the permanence of it. It's just knowing you're always going to get it. So they've always known they were going to have, have it for two years. Um, in fact, some of them only thought they were going to get it for six months guaranteed at the beginning because that's all the money we had at that time. And even just extending it to two years when we were able, you know, change their mental calculus of, you know, what do we, what can we get done? What are our goals? What are our plans? You know, six months is enough to stop some bleeding. Two years is enough. Maybe I go back to school, whatever. Um, so it definitely, the duration definitely matters. And it's definitely factored in to some extent. Um, but people seem to be treating it, I think two years is long enough for people to be living more in the, in the long term in general and planning out their their lives rather than just trying to get one concrete thing done is one thing I've noticed. Um, but there's also the, the awareness that it is going to end and they want to get themselves into a situation where when it ends, you know, they're better off than they were before, not going right back where they were. Um, so th that's all. And that, that's something we're going to leave up to the viewers to, to hash out. Like we, we envision this, the series being truly verite, like fly on the wall filmmaking and not having, narrators or talking heads tell you what to think it's like we understand that it's very um nuanced and we trust the audience to decide what that means to them and you know fight about it over the dinner table after and come to their own conclusions so i mean you've been putting a lot of your life into ubi over the past couple of years what mm -hmm. what's going to happen what do you? What are your plans after this completes in twenty twenty? Uh, I joke sometimes that you know I came, I left engineering and came to New York to pursue acting, and um, and then I met my wife Daya, who's a documentary filmmaker, and we were looking for a project, and that's where all this UBI advocacy sucked me in because we picked a UBI documentary, um, and starting an acting career is, and and screenwriting filmmaking is not easy at all and you you find yourself doing a lot of waiting of tables and bartending and things like that um and a, in a lot of cases people in the arts you, the ones that really succeed and have a, a a lasting career are the ones who come from a bit more money just like in business or anything they come from enough money to be comfortable while they put their time into their passion you know it's, it's like a startup it's investing in yourself so if you're waiting tables 35 hours a week, or you're not only losing all that time that you could be putting towards your craft um, or your business or your whatever, your novel, uh, you're also exhausted. And this idea that you should be doing this in your spare time, it doesn't really, it's, doesn't really work out that way. You, know, that you can find stories, but it, it doesn't. And so one of the things I joke about is... Uh, once this is done, you know, maybe I get sucked into more political directions. I, I don't really know where I go, but um, one of the things I want to do is get back to acting and screenwriting. And um, and uh, the joke I make is that it, it wasn't really possible for me in a world without UBI. So in order to be a, an artist, I had we had to go like make we had to go change the economy. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Steps to being an actor. Step one, <laughs> rally the masses and change the economy. Step two, you know, go to take some classes and, and try to get some auditions. 
Well, I mean, I think it, uh, my impression is it's going to kind of be hard to let all this go. And I think uh, we might not let you go either. <laughs> because yeah, you've been be tricky. fairly effective. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't imagine I'm just gonna I'm gonna quit UBI cold turkey, but I do wanna I do wanna do some artistic projects, um, and I imagine like what happens if if UBI just gets passed in some ideal situation where there's like a nice version of UBI, it gets passed, it it works out, and it proves itself, you know, um, and we all get really drunk for a week, uh, and then we're all like, okay, now what? <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm eager to face that problem, and I've got a couple of answers at least. Um, yeah, it's I'll I'll just, I'll just play it as it goes, you know. Well, um, I'm really interested to see where the documentary goes forward as well. So, let's make a plan for a follow up. Actually, when you get maybe more information on the distribution, or perhaps once it's completed, I'd like to kind of hear your reflection on that process a little more in depth. Sure. Okay, great, Conrad. Well, um, let me know when if there's any news or if there's any updates on, on either of these projects. I think a lot of people are um, really interested in both. I, I know that I've been waiting for this documentary for two years now, so I'm really excited to see how it how it uh, how it works out. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Conrad. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.